All right, we are live. I am Coach Morgan. We got Coach Dan over here from the Run Experience, and we are talking trails and ultras today here on the Run Experience channel. So if you are just joining us or if you're coming in, in we are so thankful that you are here listening and tuning in to us today. So hello. I'm uh, coming from Maine, Dan. Where where exactly are you at nowadays? I'm in St. John's, Newfoundland, and Labrador, Canada. So um, through my little office window here, I can see the most easterly point in North America. I'm, I'm as east as you can get on this continent. And that would be my state, Maine, right? Is that is that you can see the little tip of Maine up there? Is that no, what that is? No, sorry, <laughs> North America doesn't end at the United States border. Up here in Canada, we go oh, further to the, the east. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I'm uh, the most easterly point is a place called Cape Spear, and it's just outside my window a little ways. And so I'm here in Newfoundland, Canada. Uh, some of the best trails in the world to run, and I'm excited to talk trails and ultra running with my pal, Coach Morgan, today. Yeah, I haven't been to that coast of Canada. I've been on over in Vancouver, so the furthest west, essentially, that you can, well, kind of go at least down there by the border. And uh, I've run some of the trails out there, and yeah, uh, I will say that portion over there is just absolutely gorgeous. Probably one of my favorite things is just, like, the views, right? Like, yeah. God yeah. love it. Anywhere that you can be by the coast... You just always get some extra, extra good looking views over here. Um, and we are going to be taking comments today. So if you are here in the chat and you have any questions for us, please feel free to drop them in. Um, but I think I wanted to start off uh, with like some big trail talk because there was like, I don't know if you guys have heard of this race uh, called UTMB Ultra Trail Mont Blanc over there in France. And that just happened this past weekend. And uh I would say it was pretty exciting. Were you were you watching it? Did you have it up on the side of your screen? I, so <laughs> full disclosure, my my training partner and dear friend, I've got two of them, and both of them were at the starting line of the hundred mile race this past weekend. And so uh I was I was really paying close attention to those two big numbers. And then of course, if you've got the live stream up, you can see the leaders uh doing their thing and it's just a it was so much fun the thing i like most about the way they've tailored the coverage this year is that it just it feels like an olympic event you can oh my gosh you can yeah. watch cameras they had drones on all the peaks it was just an amazing bit of television to consume um and then the high drama of jim walmsley going out so hard he moved to chamonix to train for months and months and months and declared that this was his year to win. He was going to be the first American male to win the race and, and uh, to watch him just, just go to it uh, was so much fun. And then I got a shout out, you know, Canadians had their best year ever at UTMB. The second place finishers for both men and women are both Canadian born athletes. Matthew Blanchard doesn't train in Canada. Now he trains in France, but he was born and raised uh, in Quebec and, um, of course, Marianne Hogan still runs here in Eastern Canada and her performance was unbelievable. She ended up finishing second after leading the race for so long. And then, we, I mean, you don't know what's happening out there, but after the fact, we realized that, that the reason her pace slowed with about 20 miles left was that she actually tore a psoas muscle. Oh, um, I and then, didn't see that. Yeah. And then still finished super strong with a, with a ripping fast second place finish. Um, and so it's been a really, it was a great year for Canadians at UTMB. Yeah, that was so cool. And I think I'm not a hundred percent sure on the stat, but I'm going to, I'm going to rattle it off. Like I'm, I am sure, but, um, all of the races within the top 10, there was American women within that top 10. And I think three out of the four, they were uh, podium women for the American women, which is just so cool to see. Um, the American women have always um, typically done a little bit better than the American men at these races, which is just cool, you know, you know, being a girl myself. Um, it's cool to see that. Um, so I was definitely following. I had a, there was a local girl. Um, she her and her sister came in ninth and tenth in TDS and they they run around here. They live like just north of here. And it was so cool to see them come across the finish line, like not hand in hand, but, you know, like literally a second after each other, the Marion sisters. So that was really cool. They're uh, in the cross country ski world as well too, which always makes a good trail and ultra runner and just runner in general. Right. I thought, I thought there were a couple of things that stuck out to me. One of them was the starting line energy. It was the first time I ever watched the starting line of the big race and 
the energy that you could get just even watching the coverage of it was so unbelievable. And again, I had some like really dear friends that were there and I had the deepest, most real FOMO I've ever had as an adult. Uh, I've been in the lottery for UTMB for a lot of years now and I've never <laughs> done full. Uh, and so having those guys there and uh, and knowing how hard they worked to get there was really a remarkable thing. And just that energy at the starting line to see you know, 2,500 runners bottleneck at that starting line. And so many of them just crying or screaming and smiling and knowing what the difficulty. So just, I mean, if anybody doesn't know, if you tuned into this trail running uh, live show and you don't know what UTMB is, the first thing you're going to want to do when this is over is to Google it and learn about what is the Olympics for ultra running, basically. Um, and so the 100 mile race comes in at just over 10,000 meters of vert and a little over 100 miles. It it sort of goes around Mont Blanc. It's it uh, it's it's three countries, three Alps. Uh, it is an unbelievable race, and the production of this race is so great. Fifty thousand spectators at the start and finish line in Chamonix, cheering on in French. So nobody knows what they're saying, but it, presumably it's positive things. Uh, and everybody seems to have so much fun. And from my pals who were out there this year, the reports were just unbelievable how much fun everybody had it was it's a brutal race super tough uh and people never seem to share that part they just tell you what fun they had at, at the biggest in some ways not the longest maybe not the toughest not the most vert not the most controversial in some ways but maybe the biggest our sport has to offer and it was really remarkable to watch yeah and going back to what you said like the coverage i it is so cool to see that city just like be taken over by the camera crew. And it's like, they just like bow down to the runners in like a great way. You know, it's always, it's always kind of like a bummer when you see even just like local marathons and you know, they can barely get the streets closed cause like local people don't want them closed. And it's just, it's really cool to be at a place like that to see the sport of running be so appreciated, appreciated. Uh, and I wish we had like more coverage. I know they're trying for Western States last few years. They've gotten some coverage, but you know, I, no offense to them. It's nowhere near where UTMB is. And I would just love to see that. And I think it would just be so cool to be able to bring running to everyone because, you know, it's just not an accessible sport to watch. And I think it would just like, you know, grow the sport even more if people could like see it and understand and, you know, check out the views and watch the runners struggle and, it can be a really fun sport to watch. Um, you know, there are definitely some more other boring sports out there that people uh, like to watch for longer periods of time. So I, I really wish that it could uh, become a thing and hopefully, you know. The exposure, yeah, the exposure is great. I have to be honest, you know, here locally in St. John's, I've had two people who I don't know at all reach out to me over social media and say, Dan, I, you know, I know you run trails here in St. John's a ton. I, I, saw some UTMB stuff on social media this weekend. How do I get started? And it was yeah. it's just, it's a great thing for our sport to get people excited and involved. Yeah. Uh, and it was fun, man. I, I like, I don't watch a ton of sports. It was just really fun to have this on in the background. And the yeah. other thing that's so cool about it is that it takes all weekend. Yeah. So you can go live your life. And then when you get a minute, take out your phone and, and check the live. Check cover. Again. They're still running. You can yeah, check. Yeah. And one of my good pals was a mid packer this time. Another one was, was finished, finished pretty high up, but my mid pack guy was, you know, he was running for, for a couple of days. So it was fun to be able to check it. You know, I go to bed and wake up and, there he is running. I go to bed and wake up again. He's still out there. Still out there yeah. <laughs> no, that, that is ultra running. And kind of what you said, like you have people asking you questions on how to get started. I see a comment from Sean Flanagan over here in our comments. Um, says, hi, coaches. I'm about a month out for my first 50K uh, with about 7,000. I'm assuming that's feet uh, yeah. of ascent. Most of my training has been flat so far. How should I spend my time on the hills? Um in next month to best prepare? That's always a great question because I feel like people who live in flatter areas are just like, they feel like maybe they can't train for these longer races. Love the uh, rock climbing picture, by the way, Sean. Um, I feel like they just don't think that they can do that because they don't have any hills. But honestly, like this is where strength is gonna come in and be your best friend, strength training. Um, there's a ton of movements that you can simulate um, for 
hill training, right? This is going to be a lot of drive, a lot of power through those hips, through the quads. Um, I personally made an entire video about it because um, I moved from San Francisco where I could not, you know, walk a city block without going like 45 degree angles up and down. Like it was, it was steep. There was some hills there. And where I am here in Maine, I'm right on the coast. So not a ton of hills. It's just like a very small little rolly city. And so it got me thinking about that more and more. So I did make an entire video. I have a whole strength program on there. Um, but yeah, essentially I just take you through a different, a uh, few different movements, a lot of, like I said, power and drive movements in like the reverse lunges. And I think personally, um, one of the things that people, if you don't have a lot of hills and you are using strength training, that people forget about the downhills. I think people underestimate, they're like, it's a downhill, it's chill, it's e like I can just run, right? But you take so much pounding on your quads going downhill, right? So we always say anytime you land, when you're landing flat on a road, you uh, land with about two to three times your body weight on there it's less when you go uphill but it's more coming downhill because you have that pull you know you're landing with so much more mass on each step that it's really taking a beating on your quad so if you are not training that um, you're definitely going to be in a little bit of trouble so um i'm gonna i can't remember if it's the concentric or eccentric training and i always get them messed up Easy. where is yeah, yeah is eccentric yeah so that lowering slowly and then the explosive off so i've done some like uh lunges where i'm coming down very slow with my front leg and then the explosiveness um back up is really great training but honestly if you can like get to any kind of hill and yeah. just do some reps there are plenty of oh who was it who was the female who did barkley i heard it on a podcast she was like, yeah, I just have this hill in my backyard. It's the only one that I know. And I would literally just run up and down, up and down, up and down for hours upon hours. I cannot remember her name, but like it can be done. Yeah. I mean, there's a couple of things. So Sean, first of all, congratulations on registering for your first ultra. Yeah, absolutely. For you, the starting line is the hardest part of running an ultra marathon. And so getting registered and getting signed up is one of the biggest steps. Um, I def so coach Morgan, I think you're talking about Amelia Boone as the Barkley athlete that spent was it Amelia? I'm not sure, but she's, I mean, if you, if you don't know who Amelia Boone is, check her out on the internet. She's a killer athlete and an amazing philosopher around our sport. So I would totally check her out. Um, I would say this on a couple of things. So, um, an extreme circumstance here is a pal of mine who trains hard for, for mountainous ultras. He just finished the Canadian death race and he does turnarounds on an oil rig. He's an engineer. And so while he's here on shore, he's running the East coast trail with me and he's got lots of up and down and technical trails. And then he spends two weeks literally out in the middle of the ocean on an oil rig where all he's got is, is machines. He's just got treadmills. And so, he pumps that treadmill up to the highest um, incline that it's got. Sometimes that's 10% for most sort of consumer style or prosumer treadmills. And he goes at that 10% at a power hike. Power hike's a fancy term for walk for us ultra marathoners. We're unwilling to say that we walk the hill, so we power hike them. And so Chris will power hike on that belt. Then he'll flatten it out. So he'll do 30 minutes flat, 30 minutes at an incline, 30 minutes flat, 30 minutes at that extreme incline. And that's, that's his two-hour training set while he's on an oil rig in the middle of the North Atlantic Ocean. Um, but Coach Morgan's advice around strength training is certainly going to be key. Focus on your butt, everything in that posterior chain. So if you can get if you can get a strong butt, um, you get those glutes doing their job really well and firing strong on, on the uphills, then that's going to really pay some dividends for you. And I totally agree. You don't want to ignore the pressure that comes from the downhills. And so make sure you're finding some ways to smash your quads when you can so that they're, they're getting ready for it. But those, you know, congrats again for registering for that 50K. I'm excited for you. Uh, and you can do it. 7,000 feet uh, of, of vert is nothing to joke around about, uh, but it's totally attainable for your first 50K. So um, feel confident that you can get it done. Just put in the time. You'll, you'll get there for sure. Yeah, I would say also, um, it just comes down to like pacing yourself as well, too. Um, the beginning is going to feel a little easy because if, especially if you're taking it slow, but once again, you can't ignore the hills. They're going to be there and they are going to beat you up. So it's about fueling early enough to make sure that you have the energy for those hills. You don't want to be bonking going up a hill. That is just no fun at all. The right, the hills are already hard. Let's not make them harder. Um, and hydrating as well, too. And I think that goes into a question over here. Um, 
from Rachel from Rachel Katz um, saying that she has her first 85K um, coming up soon and talking about tapering in terms of nutrition and sleep. She's also a city runner, so uh, have that same same ability here. So less than a month out. Um, less than a month out, you're kind of, you know, you the training is done right at this point. There's not a ton more that you're going to be doing that's going to be super um, beneficial besides getting in some extra sleep. And I know people, like, it's so hard. Like, whenever we see the the amount of sleep. Everyone's like, if I asked everyone here, how many hours of sleep are you supposed to get? Everyone's like eight, right? That's the typical, the base number, but that is not for athletes. That is for the typical average person. That is just like sustainability at that eight. You know, when we are putting that extra stress and extra time on our bodies, we need to up that. So I would say, if you can try to aim for that nine to 10. And I know that's hard. I know everyone gets really busy, but it's about making really small steps towards that. Like just going to bed 30 minutes earlier and waking up 30 minutes later, right? Setting an alarm to specifically go to bed, even if it's not like sleeping, at least it's like you're in bed, no phones away, right? Make the sleeping situation the best that you can. Keep it nice and cool. Keep it dark. It's quiet. I know that's not always the easiest thing for all of us to do, especially if we're parents, especially if we have weird hours with jobs and things like that. I totally understand, but naps can also be your best friend if you can do that. Um, what I always love to say about sleep is you, it's just like training where you can't just try to get like cram in sleep the last few days before your race, because first of all, who's sleeping the night before the race in reality, who's actually like getting a restful night of sleep and waking up and being like, Oh my God, I slept so great. That has never happened to me ever. Right. I'm always like, did I set my alarm? Do I have all my things packed? Like I'm waking up every 30 minutes. So it's like, you have to bank those hours earlier in that week. So if your race is on the weekend, like starting Monday, use the extra time that you were doing your long runs and your training to get in some extra sleep. That is part of your training now going into those last two weeks. So take the time that, you know, that extra hour that you were out for the run, put it at the end of the night or the, in the morning and get some extra Z's in there. And for nutrition, you know, the saying is always nothing new on race day, right? We all know that saying here in the running world, nothing new on race day, new nutrition, shoes, whatever. I like to pull that to race week as well because people are like, oh, what, what should I eat the night before my longest or before my race. And I'm like, well, what did you eat the night before your longest long run? What breakfast did you have on that morning? And I'm like, they're like, oh, X, Y, and Z. You know, I had oatmeal and whatever. I'm like, well, how did you feel during that long run? They're like, yeah, my stomach felt fine, good. I'm like, perfect, do that. Cool. You don't need to do anything crazy. There's nothing new that you need to be changing. Do what worked for you in your training. And that's what training is for, is finding the right things, finding the right nutrition that works for you. There are hundreds of different options for nutrition and hydration strategies you have to find what works best for you so like that is part of your training it is training week right that's what those long runs are for testing out your clothing your shoes what types of nutrition work best for you and when your body feels like it needs to really take them in and then taking them earlier so that you don't get to that point of feeling like oh i probably should have taken something 20 minutes ago so we want to bank stuff early on in training. Um, and if you don't have anything that's working for you yet, I would also research what's on course, test that out too, um, because that could be another option for you. And if you don't like what it is, you know that you need to uh, specifically bring your own stuff. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Rachel, 85K is a killer run. Um, so yeah. way to go. That's super ambitious and I'm really excited for you. Um, I would say a couple of things. Um, this isn't from me. This is this is from St. Killian, right? If you all saw UTMB last weekend, he had an amazing thread on Instagram where he went through some kilometer markers and how he was feeling. Um, and, you know, he's, he's a remarkable athlete. And let us not compare ourselves to folks like Killian Jornet ever, with the exception of a quote that he said that I don't think I'll ever forget, which is that, an ultra, uh, an ultra trail race is really just an eating competition with some running and walking in there. Um, and I, and I think that's really the key. It doesn't matter what the problem is when you're out there, the answer is fueling, but that only works if you know the impact that that particular fuel and that amount of fuel has on your body. 
Um, if you're a month out, you do have time for at least one more big banger long run. Um, and so I would do that if you've got the time to put it in. So put in a big bang or long run and treat it like race day. So whatever shoes you plan on wearing, whatever socks you plan on wearing, um, and have your race kit and drop bags at the locations, at the distances relative to the start that you're going to have your first drop bag anyway during the race. Um, and then I'd have in that drop bag organized in the exact way that you're going to have it on race day. So you know where your energy gel is, you know where your electrolytes are. Um, if you're going to change socks or something like that, which some people like to do, um, having all that stuff organized so that on race day, you're not rifling through a drop bag. I use little, I'm looking to see if I have one around here, but I don't, I use little see-through Tupperware plastic containers for this. Um, and I use the same ones all the time and, you know, they've got labels on them. Um, and it, they've even got labels on the lid. So I know what's underneath them. So at night, if it's, if it's a night part of a, a long run and I've got a headlamp on, I know exactly where it is and they're all organized the same way so that when I reach in, I know where, what is within, in there, even if I can't see in there super well, um, it, that helps for a bunch of reasons. Over 85 K there may come a time when, um, you're not making great decisions and you're not thinking super clearly. Let's not get around 85 kilometers. There's lots of deep water in there for you to get lost in. And so some organization up front is really going to help you. Between now and race day, that organization, um, as well as sort of tapering, focusing on sleep and nutrition planning is going to be really important. And so getting organized mentally, as well as your kid organized about how you hope to feel over that 85K is going to change how you experience the race. If you put the training in, you'll still finish, you'll still do well, but how you feel during that race can change based on how organized you are going in. Uh, and so I'd really try to focus on that if you have, if you have the capacity for, um, or something else besides the sleep and and the nutrition and all of that as well as being angry while you're tapering and all of those things um i would i would try to get some organization built into you there for sure yeah i definitely so i went through that i i just did a video like last literally almost a month ago now because i had my last man standing race where you run every hour on the hour you do 4.1 six 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 six, six, six miles repeating so that uh if you finish 24 hours, it's a hundred miles and so on and so forth. And so I did an entire video about all of the things I packed and how organized it is. And Dan's absolutely right. It makes it so much easier because, you know, at any point, if it's dark and you're tired and you're, you don't want to be like fighting to look for stuff. Think of how like annoying it is when you go on vacation and you're like trying to find something in your suitcase, if it's buried, right? That's already like stressful enough sometimes. So let's not make it more stressful. And if there's a volunteer there trying to help, they can go in and find your stuff that much easier. They don't have to be rifling through and moving everything around. If you're like, I need the certain gel, it's like, boom, they got it for you. I need my headlamp. It's right there. They know where everything is. And um, for me, that video that I made about uh, my packing, it is a maximalist video. I, I am not a minimalist when it comes to packing for my ultras. Um, I only used about 15% of the things that I brought, but I was glad that I had them. And I like to prepare for kind of any situation, um, especially like a little um, first aid emergency kit, I think is always really good to have. Um, you never know, honestly, whatever. I just, I like to have it in there at all the drop bag situations um, or carrying something with me um, just because I know on these ultra in these longer races, the distance between the aid stations can be kind of far. And you think, oh, it's only four miles. But if you're feeling like crap, that four miles is going to feel real long. And you're going to be glad that you had something on your person. Yeah. Let's see you it a little bit, Morgan. We've got a ton of great questions in the comments and we're going to get back to them in a minute. But I just, there's a couple of bits and pieces that I keep in my vest, my running vest all the time. Um, and I only ever seem to use them in the deep water of tough races, but, um, without them there, I don't know how people get through some of these things. And so my, I'm going to give you my number one pick. Maybe Morgan's got one that comes to her mind too. We didn't pick this, so maybe, maybe not, but for me, it's salt tabs. Mm -hmm. So electrolyte imbalance is like one of the things that can get you really messed up when you're running a long ultra marathon. Um, and it can manifest for lots of us in different ways. For some people, it, it's decision-making late in a race. If your electrolyte balance gets kind of weird, you can, you cannot do a great job of making decisions. But for most of us, and for me, certainly, if my electrolytes get out of whack, uh, it's going to cause cramping. Um, and specifically for me, my calves cramp up. Um, and there's just not much you can do when you've got a cramped leg muscle 
when your major leg muscles cramps up, there's just no way to keep any pace. Suddenly you're sitting on a rock trying to stretch out your calf. And then the moment you get running again, it, it binds back up again. And so the, the answer there is to change the electrolyte balance of your body. The quickest way to do that is by putting lots of salt in. Um, the right amount of salt, not just lots of salt. <laughs> to be, to be very clear, salt. <laughs> there are lots of products on the market that will do this for you. This is in addition to whatever electrolyte drink you've got with you. So for lots of us, myself included, the two 500 mil bottles that are generally on the front of your running vest, I keep electrolytes in there. I keep water in the back. Um, and sometimes I don't keep anything in the back if I know that there's not too, too long between aid stations and two 500 mil bottles would be the trick. I just have one of them water and one of them electrolytes. But I always have with me, the product that I choose is Salt Stick Fast Chews. They didn't pay me to say that. It's just I've tried all of them and that's the one that works best for me. The Fast Chews are really important for me because I don't want to have to take a capsule, swallow it with a bunch of water, uh, and then wait for that capsule to dissolve in my gut before it does anything. The fast chews you can chew up with your teeth. It's just what it says. And it's just a little bit quicker release to get those electrolytes working to your muscles. The only thing I'll caution you is that don't try them on race day. You've got to get used to this. Yeah. Um, don't try anything on race day because you can get oversalted, right? The same way that you can get undersalted and oversalted is actually way, 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 way worse in a race setting. Um, it can really impact performance even worse than cramping can. And if you do decide to go with some sort of a salt tab, like a fast chew that I like to use, um, you got to take a bunch of water with it right away. And so if you happen to be out of water and you're cramping up, well, water is the first solution and salt is the second solution. And you can't really do the second one if you don't have access to the first one. And so uh, you shouldn't let yourself run out of water on an ultra marathon. I say that as a person who has many times let himself run out of water on ultra marathons. Um, but those, you know, having some salt tablets is certainly key for me in a race setting. I'm always pushing harder in a race than I am training. Uh, and that's when I'll find a way to get a little dried out and, and find some cramping. Morgan, what's your number one, what's your go-to hack that you keep in your vest? Yeah. So I feel like this is, you know, like when they like walk up to celebrities and they're like, what's in your purse? I feel like that's this, but just like, what's in your pack? Um, <laughs> so this is amazing. Um, yeah, I definitely, so I, as a smaller human being do two 250 the 500s are honestly just like they're too annoying they're too annoying to have on my chest and i don't like having it in my camel back like it or you know on my pack because i prefer to like keep a long sleeve shirt back there or something like that and i don't like it like bouncing around on my front it doesn't seem to bounce so i do the same thing though i have one electrolyte one water um, along with all of my other types of fuel, I always try to either carry like a mini, um, chapstick or, um, squirrel's nut butter in my Solomon vest. There's like a little tiny pocket right here. And it's just small enough to like, just for like a little tiny tube. And I keep that there, um, because I, I end up, I have chafing and it's so, it can like, it hurts so bad, especially if you're like salty and sweaty and it just gets in there. So like for under my armpits and like if I have a um a crop top on or I'm just wearing my sports bra with um my vest on right on the little top of my rib cage here right underneath where my sports bra is my vest will rub right there and like that's not the best problem it's just the way that it fits me and because I have it tight and whatever but if that like starts to wear away that gets really really painful um so I like to just like give a little swoop there um and especially if I'm doing like elevation stuff like when i was out in broken arrow um in lake tahoe i'm here i'm at sea level like the ocean is like right there we are we are at sea level here um so going up to almost nine thousand feet i was just so dry so just being able to like put it on my lips um gave me the like sensation that i was at least more hydrated i was definitely taking in water and electrolytes but um, continuing to lip, lick your lips is like terrible because it just makes it worse and worse. So at least having that on there and for like a little bit of sun protection as well too. So yeah, definitely like the, the squirrel's nut butter is my favorite um, just because it's a little bit better for you and it lasts super long time and I've had it in the rain and all of the things and it stayed on really well. Um, that and like if I'm having any issues with my feet because like it takes a while to kind of notice sometimes if you're starting to have anything. So I'll start the race by 
putting it all up in between my toes. And I learned that from my first hundred when I didn't do anything. And you can see there's a video, there is a little video at the clip at the end of my Halloween hundred uh, recap video. And my toes just look trashed. Honestly, it's, there was blisters on like every other toe and it was so bad. Um, so yeah, no, they're, they're getting, they're getting all glued up in there. <laughs> so anytime I start to feel something, um, just kind of like take a swatch and just, stub some in there and uh keep going so that's probably like my i think that's like saved me at least um the most yeah that's great advice hey we've got a question that came in a while back from jason who says how can i lower my heart rate during threshold runs so this isn't trail and ultra specific but it is a super good question as we think about how we trail for longer distance things and so we'll take a minute and dig into this a little bit um and so we're talking about threshold training really quickly what that is that's part of the sort of 15% of your running week for most of us, that's gonna be at higher than easy pace, but lower than your full sort of max effort for that week. Um, and that heart rate is one of the ways that we measure this, right? And so um, this is not your conversational pace, not your easy zone. You can't chat with somebody that is sort of breathless running. Um, and the question is, how do we how do we lower our heart rate during those special runs? Jason's really not going to like my answer. Nobody likes the answer to this question. The answer to this question is to run your your easy runs easier. This is a cardiovascular health problem, not a problem to be very clear. Whatever your heart rate is is fine, um, but if your goal is to lower that heart rate during the threshold runs, therefore being able to run those threshold runs faster, which is actually the goal, I suspect. Although having a lower heart rate when you run hard is never a goal. It's being able to run faster when you run hard is what people want to achieve. And so what we've got to do is we've got to build that engine a little better on those easy runs. Jason, I don't know anything about you. I don't know how you train. Um, I don't know any of your stats, how many miles you're running a week, what your heart rate is, how old you are, and I can still tell you with a lot of confidence that your easy runs are probably too hard the reason that i can tell you that is that almost all of us our easy runs are too hard yeah. um, and so if you want your heart rate to be a little lower during your threshold paces you've got to run your easy runs a little bit easier that's going to help build that cardiovascular engine and do a whole bunch of other things that's going to allow your heart to be a little more effective as you're doing that harder work during the threshold pace um, this leads into a follow-up question that we had from Sean and Morgan, we'll let you jump in on this. It's almost the same answer. So I'm not skipping over this, but Sean, who we answered his first question has got another, had a quick follow-up in the chat about what his training zones should be leading into that first 50 K. Um, I think I remember you're about a month out. And so just stick in zone one and zone two, Sean, there's no reason to blow the doors off anything, um, in the last few weeks, if you've got time to do small speed intervals, feel free to do it, but I wouldn't do any long threshold runs a month out. Um, especially not if you're a little bit concerned about how much hill training you've gotten in. What we don't want to do is stress specifically your calves by doing some hard work within a month. So, so do some shorter sprinty type work, um, but don't do any super long threshold runs, stick in that zone one and zone two. So sorry, Morgan, I'll throw back to you. You can answer Jason's question around heart rate uh, for threshold runs. And then maybe if you got something to add around Sean's follow-up, you can go for it. No, yeah, that's that's super great. And I think one of the things that they're like, well, how do I know if I'm running them easy enough, right? That's always kind of the follow-up question that comes with that. Um, nose breathing is probably the biggest thing that you can do. Um, try, try nose breathing. And if you can't nose breathe on your run for like, especially the, like the first few minutes are always a little weird of a run, right? We can all admit like, especially if you didn't warm up, which we don't like anyways, but if you didn't warm up and you're just kind of like getting into it, your heart rate's probably going to spike a little bit and then we'll tend to like even out. So like get through the first few minutes and then see if you can literally just breathe through your nose. So your, your mouth is tight. I'm just breathing in and out through my nose. And if I feel like that's like, <laughs> like I have to like gasp for a breath, probably, probably a little too quick there. Right. So nose breathing does take time to like get used to. So if you're feeling that and you're like, I'm like walking with nose breathing. Okay. Maybe, maybe we need to adjust, but like you can do it in like 30 second intervals. I'm just going to breathe through my nose, then breathe out through my mouth and nose or however, whatever's comfortable to you for two minutes. And then 30 seconds on just nose breathing. You can do an interval workout essentially, or like interval nose breathing, interval workout with just breathing through your nose. Um, It'll get easier over time to like get used to it, but it's really a good indicator um, if you're going a little too 
fast on those easy runs. Yeah, just a quick follow up on nose breathing. Um, I had never, ever, ever tried nose breathing while I ran until I first found the Running Three YouTube channel a few years ago. Um, and the thing I found right away when I tried it was that my heart rate would sp spike first. It would settle in, but more important than that for me was that I'm not an anxious person, but I would get these wild feelings of anxiety when I was trying to nose breathe while I ran at an easy pace. Um, and so you've got to get your head right with that feeling when you try nose breathing for the first little while, the first few times you try it on your run. Know that that feeling of anxiousness where you should kind of feel your shoulders coming up around your ears and you're feeling very tight. Be conscious of it. You're okay. You're just breathing through your nose. You do it all day anyway when you're not running. Just try to consciously continue on. Let your shoulders move down your back. Try to take nice, big, long breaths through your nose and slow down, of course. Um, but, I, but I really do think you'll be okay. Um, and that's a really good tip. I just want to make sure you know that that feeling of anxiety is going to come up for you, for lots of us anyway. Just work through it, breathe through it, and you'll be all right. That's great. Um, there's a question from Justin over here. Uh, I'll just reiterate what brand I was talking about because it does sound funny when I say it. Um, talking about like the what kind of cream or the lube that I use for the fleet and blisters. I use, it's literally called Squirrel's Nut Butter. That's it. It's amazing. I really like it. It's like the coconut oil based. Um, so it just smears on really nicely. Um, and you do just use your fingers. So I would always say like kind of make sure they're clean sometimes i guess if it's you're doing it on yourself because i know a lot of the other ones have like um like the body glide um the body glide just goes on like a little hard for me sometimes kind of like if you have a deodorant that's like a little bit older it just doesn't it just doesn't glide as nicely for me um so i like the squirrels nut butter that i can just like take it with me and it's like small they come in bigger things but i like getting the smaller ones so you can have it um and then there was a question about i think what pack what packs we use the one that i was talking about the one that i always have it's literally the black one that i'm wearing in any video that I do with trail running, it's the Solomon. Oh gosh, what's she called? It is this. It, they're just called like they go by liters, and um, you know what? I'm gonna look. I'm gonna look it you up. Liters up, and I'll tell you what mine is. Well, Dan tells you what it is. Yeah, listen, so there are lots of great pack brands out there, and no one has paid us to give you this answer. Um, I use the Solomon pack as well, and I really, really love it. I, I use the Advanced 5 set for a long time. That's a 5-liter pack. That eventually died on me. It's not, an, uh, um, it's not a problem with the pack. I put a little more than 10,000 kilometers on that pack before it died. Uh, and so let's say maybe it was just not the years but the mileage. Um, I now use the 6-liter version of, this, of the same pack, and, uh, and the Solomon packs are great. They're only as big as the stuff you put in them. Um, and so they've got lots of pockets that'll stretch so you can pack lots of things in them for super long runs and you can then pack super light for shorter runs. Um, there are lots of options out there. Um, I was a Lululemon ambassador for a long time and they just put out a pack that I, that I had a very small part of designing um, just in a, as a tester with some feedback. And so that packs a very good, much cheaper option than some of the Solomon options are. I would suggest it's it's best suited for short ultra marathons and not longer uh, ones where you've got to pack lots of standard kit like rain gear and, and uh, like an emergency bivy, that sort of thing. But if you're looking for something a little more minimal, that is not the way to go. Uh, I do think Solomon, though, I mean, listen, at the starting line of a big race, when you look around at your peers, um, a lot of them out there. yeah, most of us are, most of us have tried a bunch and are wearing Solomon packs. Yeah, so the Solomon one is, is the Sense Pro, and then there's different sizes with it. Not sizes per se, like like small, medium, large. It's like different liters, so some of them have a lot more pocket space, a little less pocket space. Whatever you're looking for, you know, whatever kind of adventure fuels you. Um, so that's the one that I like. It's really lightweight. I don't like snaps on some of mine. This one has like the little bungees. I will say it probably wears down a little bit more but it's like easy for me to just like adjust them and i always feel like this the buckles will like rub you know especially just like being on a female and there's just more places to rub for it um i just really like it because it like fits very nicely and contours to the body um and yeah that's so that's the one that i use um and i've used it i've had the same one for four years now and it's like the only vest that i've had but honestly i would suggest because i was able to try it on i tried out a friends i tested it um but if you can like go to a running store and like just put some on and like 
do the bounce around test and move and like see how it feels like uh, you know not everything is going to fit everybody the same way you know look for like the cut underneath the arms i like that to be a little bit lower because i don't want it up underneath my armpits you know how it fits everywhere and like think of like the things that you would pack and how would they fit in there and all the other things there's so many things to think about when when getting a vest it's almost just like a pair of shoes right it's not there's not gonna be one perfect fit for everyone but um always yeah. like the, it, products that i use i always like to you know let people know about them yeah we've got a great question from streamer tim that says i've got a 50 mile trail ultra coming up in october but i'm finding that runs over three hours my hip flexors are so bad i can barely lift my feet is this weak glutes and is it fixable um, that's a super good question, Tim, and I'm sorry that you're finding yourself hurting when you're out there on the trail. This is, this is a weakness problem. Um, glutes are probably part of the problem, but listen, sometimes, sometimes it hurts where you, where you're weak, man. And so if your hip flexors are the problem, I'd focus on opening up that area, spending some time stretching and then strengthening that particular area. Um, I will say though, that having strong glutes can cover up just about any weakness you've got out there on the trail. If your butt's doing a lot of the work, that's a big, strong muscle. Um, and if you get it trained properly, you can do a lot of good work. So, uh, I'd love to hear Morgan. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Sorry. It's streamer trim. I don't know how to say that, but anyway, you've got the, it's, it's up on the screen. Um, I've had hip flexor trouble as well. Um, glute bridges are going to be your friend for sure. And so, um, the exercise I would suggest to start with here is going to be an exercise ball with your heels up on the ball, up into that glute bridge, and then a good marching motion with your feet, keeping your hips up the whole time. So I don't want your hips dipping while you're doing it. Um, 10, 10 per side, 10 per leg is going to be a great place to start. And whatever hurts as you're doing that marching motion is probably what you need to get stronger. Yeah. And with hip flexors, a lot of the time it's like, is it weak? or are they tight? And I feel like people go back and forth because it is, it does get hard to tell just from like being out there. Like, is this a weak motion or are they just so tight? Because most of us probably sit all freaking day during our jobs, right? So our hip flexors get really tight. They're in that shortened position. And then if we just like go out and run, they're just like, whoa, what are, you, what are we doing, man? So there's a couple different tests that you can do. And one's just like sitting on the ground with like your hands at your side and like your feet are straight out. And then like trying to like having like a cup or something like that and lifting your foot up and over the cup. Can you get it over the cup? If you're like, ugh, just like barely getting it off the ground, that might be, you know, a little bit of weakness in there um, or a tight, you know, so you want to be able to test these things out. Um, and then like the couch stretch, we love the couch stretch. It's a great um, thing that you can do kind of any time where I, it's kind of hard to explain how to get into it, but you're like in a lunge position with one, le um, one leg up against the couch or the wall or whatever with like a cushion underneath your knee. And then you're trying to sit up nice and tall. So you're like in that lunge position and you're stretching the leg that is um, back against the couch. We have tons of videos. You can type in couch stretch. Kelly Starrett is amazing at explaining this. Um, and that's a really good way to stretch out those hip flexors or like the runner's lunge, things like that. Um, so making sure that you're adding those into your warm up, and then the like lifting up and over the cup into your, um, strength training, just little bits here and there to really make sure that they're, uh, they're good to go. Hey, we have got some questions about transitioning from road running and shorter distance things to ultra marathons. And so I, there, there are a couple of questions here. One from Familia, there's one a little further back, um, somebody asking specifically about whether or not you need sort of need to do a marathon before you do an ultra marathon. And so I think it's worth addressing some of this and maybe, um, I know coach Morgan, people ask you sometimes about how you got into ultra running and what you yeah. found, and we can do some of that work, but uh, you know, I'll go really, sh I'll give you the super short answer that I know that coach Morgan and I agree on, which is that you don't need to do anything friends. No, no one says you got to do a 5k before you do a 10k before you do a half a full and then move up to a 50k you should do what's going to fit your life and what, what excites you at the time so if running a road marathon is really exciting for you then that's what you should train for and that's what you should do um running a road marathon has never ever ever excited me for a single day in my life and that's why i've never ever run a road marathon um, i've run road half marathons as part of a training cycle 
Um, but I've never run a road marathon. I, I assume I will at some point in my life, but I, it just isn't exciting to me at all. Um, and so I went from a, a, a half marathon distance to a 50 K distance. Um, and that 50 K was a trail run and the half marathon obviously was a road run. Um, and so, no, you don't need to do that. How do you transition from a structured road plan to an ultra marathon plan? It's a great question. And it deserves a really long answer that I'm not going to give you today, um, but that I will say this, the the key difference between road training and trail training is just longer time on feet at those low or easy heart rate zones. And so focus on extending your long runs further and further and further, depending on the length of your race, further and further and further and keeping them at that easy heart rate as you do those long training runs. And then to when it comes time to do the harder running in your training plan or in your week, keep those harder runs as prescribed for a longer distance road plan. Those threshold sessions and anaerobic sessions are going to be really useful to you as a trail runner and you don't need to add you don't need to change them or adapt them very much from that marathon plan to make them really useful in a long distance trail plan. But where you've got to make those changes is on the longer runs. If you're new to trail running and new to endurance training, I would suggest thinking about time on feet and elevation as really important factors as opposed to distance. And so, you know, if a 10K is going to take you 90 minutes on the trail, that's perfectly respectable. If you've got a technical trail and you've got some vert, um, you know, keep in mind how long you've got to train. Um, and then the other thing I would keep in mind about distance or volume around training is that up to a point, up to sort of the 100 mile distance, um, even 100K distance, this is certainly true. Your weekly training has to be comfortable at your race distance. And so let me give you some examples. If you're going to run a 50 mile ultra marathon, but you're not able to run 50 miles a week consistently without getting hurt, you're probably not ready for that 50 mile ultra marathon. Now there are lots of, we all, listen, there's gonna be exceptions to all of these rules, but I do think that one holds true for a lot of us, that if you can't run your race distance per week without getting hurt, you may not be ready for that. And so if you can't consistently run 50K a week without getting yourself hurt, a 50K ultra marathon is probably not the best idea today. It doesn't mean you can't do it. it. doesn't mean you can't do it without getting hurt. It's just not something that I'd feel super confident in. 50 miles is the same. And up from there, um, you know, if you, you know, we, we talked to somebody earlier who's got an 85K coming up. I personally would want to be running 85 kilometers per week for sure um, before I decided to, to hit that starting line with any confidence. Yeah, I think the only thing that doesn't change that would be like anything, uh, the 100 mile mark. Yeah. Uh, because we don't want to be probably... For the majority of the population, yes, there are plenty of pros who are doing 100 mile weeks training for a marathon. That's on the road, but that's also time on feet, as uh, Dan said, right? We have to kind of think about that a little bit differently from the, ooh, got a little sunburst there. From the 100 mile point, um, we're probably not doing 100 mile weeks consistently because that's on the trails. That's that's a full time job. That is 100% a full-time job if we're going slow in the pace that we're supposed to be going at. But yeah, absolutely. Um, I agree with that. And I think someone else mentioned um, Noah Buchanan talking about like the 10% rule uh, of your long runs and like overall distance. Yeah, I, I like the 10% rule, especially if you're starting to build up. Um, anything much more than that is a really big increase in mileage. Um, and especially if you've really done, if you're, Say you've done the half marathon distance um, and then you're trying to go to the 50 miles, that's a big jump and that's a big jump in time on feet. So really nothing more than that 10% um, is what I would do. And I like to, whenever I'm building out a plan, I build out for like four weeks in the 10% build. And then like I have a little bit of a drop off and then building back up on that 10% just to always kind of like give a little bit of a rest and a reprieve you know, absorb all of that training, um, get some extra sleep and then move into, um, some higher mileage. I'm you, the sun keeps following me here. <laughs> yeah, the question is great. And the two don't need to be different. And so the Jack Daniels plan structure that does have sort of jumps on uh, that four week increment, um, isn't necessarily more or less than that 10% rule. So if you go 10% week over week, 
versus Jack Daniels third week and then a jump, sometimes you you actually get the same volume bump over a one month period. Um, and so how you do it is going to be whatever works best for you. Certainly Jack Daniels plans are very, very, very well thought out and well thought of for that reason. Um, 10%, the 10% rule is a little more conservative than a lot of Jack Daniels plans are. And so if you're concerned about injury, um, like we all are, unless we're 19 years old, um, it seemed to be bulletproof back then, but, um, maybe I'd, I'd think about that 10% rule if I were going to pick one over the other. Um, but, but you're not going to go wrong. If you follow a Jack Daniels plan, you're still going to get where you want to get at the end of the day. Hey, we've got a bunch of questions coming in and we are starting to run out of time. Um, Coach Morgan, what's your favorite race? What's the coolest race you've ever run? Oh, man, that's a really, well, I just want to say if anyone's just joining us now, welcome Coach Morgan and Coach Dan. We are talking trails. We got another about 10 minutes here and we are going to try to get to all of your questions. There is definitely a lot of questions that are grouping together that we do have answered. We might not be able to answer them here, but we do have answered on the Run Experience channel. So you can go to our channel search it in there. And I promise you will see probably one of our faces talking about trails and like how we got into it. And, um, a lot of that stuff, kind of a lot of, lot of the things that we've discussed today. So be sure to check those out after, if we don't get to your questions, um, I'm going to answer two in a row because I see a lot of people are also talking about favorite types of fuel. And we kind of touched on that a little bit, but for me, my favorite race that I've done, it's such a hard question. I'm going to stick with trails. I did this one race in golden, um, British Columbia. Um, it's in the Canadian Rockies. Um, it's called the golden ultra and I didn't do it, but it's like a three day stage race. And that was like my first experience because I'm still new to the ultra running world and trail world in general. And this was like one of my first like mountain races that I had trained for. I had done some like ultra stuff that was, you know, um, just on some like local trails, still in California, still beautiful trails, but like just it was like perfect September like just turning to fall like leaves were changing and like the views were just insane and it's kind of it is very sky race race-esque where you're kind of like on those ridge tops and you can just like see mountains forever and I remember that was just like one of the most beautiful races that I've ever been at and um kind of experienced with those highs and lows and was able to like have a nice downhill finish which I I personally um am a downhill runner I enjoy the downhills um so it was just like a awesome beautiful course and it was really well put together um and that was a 50 it was like a 50 or 60k kind of like in between there um and then i see a lot of people talking about like that martin fuel and um what energy gels are like that they like personally um i've been using spring energy gels forever um my body prefers um not uh, my body prefers real sugars as opposed to like a stevia and the fake sugars that are in some of them. Not all of the other gels are out there, but um, I like that spring is the real food. And I think it's a good introductory um, gel because a lot of times people go to um, the like a little bit of like the harsher ones with like a little bit more like chemicals into it and things like that. And it can be a little bit harsher on their stomach. And I think going back to um, whose point was it was his name, um, Jason, um, who was talking about transitioning from the 10 from the roads to the trails. That was probably the hardest thing that I had was the eating because, um, you know, during a half marathon, you might we would suggest it, but you might not take anything with you. Some road runners will maybe take one gel maybe and like hit a sip of water on one stop if they're going quickly. Um, but like that too, you know, if you're somewhere, someone who's around that two hour mark, you can probably survive off of the breakfast that you had. Um, and like one gel. Um, so that was like the biggest thing for me is I really didn't take a lot. I don't, my first marathon, I had a handful of jelly beans and one like Dixie cup of water, which was not ideal at all. And I didn't know, but that was like the biggest thing was eating while running. Cause as Dan said, as, da as Dan said that Killian said, running is an eating contest. Um, and you just have to like practice doing it. And honestly, it's become, you know, I'm really glad that I have practiced it. I think it's like made my stomach a little bit stronger, um, and practicing just like eating and letting your stomach feel weird sometimes and still trying to eat through it because you literally never know what's um, going to happen out there on race day. Yeah, I've been, there, 
I so I like real food as well. Um, I try to. I, I mean, this is going to sound wild to a lot of people, but for super long runs, I bring pies that I've cooked myself, little meat pies that I cook in a muffin dish. They're famous on the trails around here. If you run into me on the trail, I may offer you a meat pie in the middle of the wood. Um, and they're small. There are a few bites, and I keep them in the back of my pack for gels. So a, a thing that I purchase as opposed to a thing that I make myself. I tend to use a company called Endurance Tap. Again, they don't they don't provide me with anything. I, I buy these things. Uh, and it's maple syrup and ginger and salt. Um, so it's real food. I happen to like the caffeinated version because I'm addicted to caffeine. Um, and so when I'm out for a long run, if, if I start during an ultra, especially if I've been running since early, early in the morning, I can actually bump up against a caffeine headache uh, mid morning. I haven't had my normal dose of espresso. Um, and so some caffeinated gels can make a big difference for me just to literally keep that caffeine headache at bay. Um, we've got, we'll try to squeeze in a few more questions in rapid fire. Someone who's decided to call themselves Dan Morgan's got a question. Um, how long should I dedicate to zone two training before I start trying to repeat quicker miles for multiple miles? 80% of your time, my friend, I do at least a month with at least 80% of your running in zone one and zone two before I bumped up to any type of speed work. Um, and so that's going to do a couple of things. Number one, it's going to make sure you don't get hurt when you start to bust out that speed work. So take a month and at least 80% of your running for that first month, um, is in that zone one and zone two. Yeah. And that's like a hard question to ask. Cause we, once again, we don't have any background on the training. Um, like six minute miles, is that fast for you? Is that slow for you? But I'm like talking about like just moving up into mile repeats in general. It kind of depends on what you're training for. Um, but yeah, that zone two, like I like to follow the 80 20 rule as close as I can. Once, like Dan was saying earlier, 80% of my training is chill, it's easy, it's conversational, and 20% is when you're starting to put in the work. But if the, in the first couple of weeks when you're building up into a training plan, I would say it's probably like a little bit less, it's a little less intense. You really want to make sure that you know you're building your body strong before you put it under too much stress. So I really like to have like more strength training in the beginning of my plan, kind of just like easier base building stuff depending on where you are um, in your training. Um, I do love this question because I said myself personally that I am a downhill runner. Um, a lot of things that can be helpful is like, what's our fear here? Our fear, fear is falling. So we need to be more confident with not falling. And a lot of that is like quickness and reactivity in the feet. So like agility work, you know, those like agility ladders that they have where your feet are moving really quick, doing that super helpful. Um, and then if you have like any kind of flat, flatter trails that you can do some tempo runs on that don't really have a ton of up and down hills, but have the rocks and the roots and all the things that are out there. Um, that can be super helpful. Just like getting confidence on it when it's flat. Cause like I, I've fallen many times it happens. It's going to happen. But if you can fall in like a safer environment on a flat trail, it's, I hate to say that it's good to practice falling, but like, if you, you know what I mean? It's just like anything else. Like once it happens, like, you know how you're going to react to it and it becomes like a little less scary. So don't so much be afraid of falling, right? Like you don't have to, like, there's so many speeds. I feel like we try to go downhill so fast. Like just take it a little bit easier and go down and work on the technique. It's also about reading the trails. It takes a little while to get used to and like where your next footstep is going to be. And that's just like that cognitive thinking. I think that's why like those agility drills with the ladder um, and things like that are going to be really helpful for just like my brain talking to my feet um, a lot quicker. Yeah, definitely. Amanda, that's a great question. And it's a challenge for lots and lots and lots of trail runners. And so know that you're not alone in this. Um, we've got some videos on the channel about downhill running. And so check those out. They're going to give you some yeah. form tips that are going to help, but also some technical trail tips that'll help. I love downhill running and it changed the way I felt about trail running when I became really confident on the downhill. So there's something really freeing and childlike about bombing down a technical trail. Um, you've got to get your legs pretty bomb proof to do that though. And so you've got some strength training to do, uh, to make sure your quads can handle those eccentric contractions. The other thing I would tell you to do is, is pick a trail that you want to love, but that you find the downhills a little bit scary on. And then I'd really make it your own. And yeah. I would run it 
I would run it as often as you're gonna gonna want to train and get really used to some of those downhills. What happens is that when you know what's coming, you can stop looking at your feet and you start looking a little bit further and further and further ahead of you. That's actually going to change your running form and your posture is going to allow you to keep your shoulders down and back and look up a little bit more. That's going to change the way it feels to run without having to really focus on where your feet are actually hitting the ground. That's going to allow you to have a little more confidence. And so uh, practice makes perfect. It's a really boring it's a boring answer, but the truth of it is, is the more you run a specific downhill, the easier it's going to be to run on that downhill. The only other thing I would say is that for a, a small percentage of people, but for some people, um, their shoes are really hurting their downhill running. And so I love running in minimalist trail shoes, but if I don't have some padding underneath my feet, I find it really, really difficult to enjoy the downhill running. And so if you're running in a, a really, really minimalist trail shoe, um, maybe it's the rocks that are hurting your feet that are causing you to have some of that fear. And so maybe think about something with a tiny bit more padding. I'm not, I'm not advocating for a high stack shoe. Um, but I do think that there, there's a way to have it all, maybe a rock plate in your shoes. I know ultra superiors come with a rock plate that makes it, uh, downhill running a lot easier for some people. And that allows your toes to stay nice and wide in the toe box as well, which can help on downhills as well. Yeah. And with that, like grip as well too, there are some shoes that are great trail shoes for like, you know, your typical, like California coast where it's very easy gravel, but like I'm here in the East coast where everything is very rocky and very wet. Um, so the shoes that I use for that, um, they're called VJ, uh, like V and then J, um, their, their grip is honestly unmatched for me. Um, I have been able to be really a lot more confident and like have trust in my shoes that they're going to hold me. But once again, it is just, it's training. It's, it's doing it. It's being repetitive with it. It's practice makes perfect type of situation again. Um, yeah, it's, it's just working on those things, um, little by little. I know we're getting a lot more questions in here. Um, I know that we definitely have some of the questions I'm seeing over here, but, um, like we said before, um, answers on our channel. Um, but Dan and I, we got, we got to go, but I'm <laughs> so glad I am. So this was, we were like, Oh man, is any, we know we're like the run experience channel, but we're really happy to see trail runners here and having a lot of questions about trail running. Um, so that's like, I think we'll definitely be diving more into some trail content. We're definitely going to take some of these comments we see here and, you know, um, put them into some videos so we can be more in depth, right? We love just being able to rapid fire answer these questions, but there is questions on here that we would love to get into a deeper conversation with and have a little bit more in depth information so that you guys can learn the best that you can. Um, but for now, I think I think we're gonna I think we're gonna head out. How's that sound, Dan? This is, great. This, was my, this is my first YouTube live, and I had a lot of fun. So thanks for tuning in, everybody. <laughs> thanks for the thoughtful questions, uh, and and we'll see you back on the channel. Yeah. Thanks everyone so much for coming. Um, check out the rest of the channel if you have any more questions or drop your questions into a YouTube video um, like at this one at the bottom once it gets posted on our YouTube channel and we can at least help you navigate um, your questions that you have so you can get out there and enjoy the trails just as we have. Bye guys. <laughs>